Hello, everybody, and welcome to this episode of Sports Legends of the Carolinas. I'm your host, Scott Fowler, sports columnist for the Charlotte Observer, where I've worked since 1994. And as always in this podcast, I'm traveling across the Carolinas, seeking out some of my very favorite sports legends. In this episode, we're going to catch up with Leonard Hamilton, the legendary Florida State basketball coach who grew up in Gastonia, North Carolina. We're not in Florida to do this interview, though. Coach Hamilton was gracious enough to give us some time during an FSU road trip. So we're in Clemson, South Carolina, in an ice cream parlor of all places, planning to get the scoop on Hamilton's extraordinary career. The Florida State Seminoles, Atlantic Coast Conference men's basketball champions 2020 for the Atlantic Coast Conference. Congratulations. 75-year-old Leonard Hamilton is close to finishing his 22nd season coaching the Florida State Seminoles. Hamilton is FSU's all-time winningest coach, having surpassed 400 wins at the school. He was the two-time Big East Coach of the Year at Miami and the three-time ACC Coach of the Year at Florida State. He's also previously been the head coach at Oklahoma State and for one year in the NBA with the Washington Wizards. His stories about growing up poor in Gastonia, North Carolina, in a highly segregated society in the 1950s and 60s are going to floor you. Leonard Hamilton, next, on Sports Legends of the Carolinas. Coach Hamilton, welcome to the show. Well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be talking to someone of your stature. <laughs> <laughs> Hardly, but you're kind. Uh, but I have been a longtime admirer of yours, and you grew up just down the road from Charlotte in Gastonia, North Carolina, and I know you have some great stories about that about that. So maybe just start me off with that. Where did you grow up? Who raised you? Well, I want you to know, before I get into that, I look for the Charlotte Observer just about every day. Really? Gaston, okay. Gazette, and yep. the Charlotte Observer. Well. Because um, during that era, you know, as a youngster growing up, you, you went, when you're into sports, you, you wanted to stay up on everything. And not only was I a great follower of the ACC, I was a great follower of all the schools in, in North Carolina. And I kept up with everything. So I was a kind of walking <laughs> You were a sports section uh, oh, yeah. uh, reader early. I oh, love yeah. it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Well, tell me, uh, besides getting the newspaper each day, what else <laughs> were you doing in Gastonia? When I was a youngster growing up, I, I came through segregation. And uh, we, were, we were on one side of town and other folks was on the other side of town. And it was kind of an experience, but I was very fortunate to uh, I think I had a good moral compass. Uh, my parents, my mother went to the seventh grade, my father went to the ninth grade, and they always complained about they had a ceiling on what, what they could provide for us because they didn't get the education. So they always talked about getting an education. I never lived more than 30 or 40 yards from my church. And every time the church door opened, you know, we were in it, which gave me a pretty good solid moral background. I remember at four, four or five years old, my mother would give me a nickel to play in Sunday school and a dime to play in, in regular church. And uh, I would walk up to the church and she would watch me from the porch and my aunt lived exactly in front of the church. I remember as a youngster walking up to the stop sign, looking to the right and looking to the left. And then I had to run across the street. <laughs> <laughs> you know, to make sure a car wasn't going to hit right, me. Right, and I ran up to church, and, and that was every Sunday. Ah. And uh, What was the church's name? Mount Zion Baptist Church on the corner of Morrison and Alice, Allison, where everybody's somebody and Christ is all. <laughs> <laughs> that was our motto. <laughs> where everybody's somebody and Christ is all. Well, so you were raised in the, in, in the church, and, um, and you had how many brothers and sisters? Here? I had three brothers and a sister by my mother's second marriage. Mm -hmm. uh, her, her first husband passed, and she had, uh, she had four kids by her first marriage, three boys and one girl. Mm -hmm. And then she had uh, three boys, uh, or four boys, I'm sorry, and one girl by her second marriage. So uh, we didn't all live together, yeah. was, uh, but we really enjoyed each other. We had great relationships. They lived out in the country in Cleveland County, Shelby, in the Shelby area. And we were in Gastonia, but we always had a good relationship. Y'all were the big city, Gastonia. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
it was a big city compared to, yeah, to them. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, rural Cleveland County. I know exactly what that looks like. Well, um, well how would you describe, were y'all uh, poor, middle class? Oh, what? We, we were poor, but we didn't know how poor we were mm. because there was a lot of love, a lot of spirit, a lot of togetherness, and, um, and uh, we, we enjoyed each other in our little community. Uh, I lived, obviously, my, with my mother being a domestic worker and my father being a truck driver, and, and we having a house full of kids. It, it wasn't a whole lot of money, but it was a whole lot of love. Yeah. I, I always tell people, I think that my father had such an influence, my father and mother had great a great influence on me. And I credit them for, even though we were in those segregated times when we, we had me, we have meager means, they never complained. Uh, they never taught me to be bitter about anyone or anybody. Uh, we didn't have the bigotry conversations in, in my home. My father always said that all he wanted to do was be paid the same thing for doing the same job that everybody else was doing and that uh, he wished he had his education. And he thought that uh, it would be best for us to understand we had to find a way to get our education. And one thing that stuck with me, he said, but understand this, I have absolutely no money. <laughs> for you. So, so you figure it out. You, so you have to figure it out by yourself. Huh, wow. But you gotta figure it out how to get it. And, and so you had that as a yeah. as a as a measuring stick. You had to figure it out. Mm-hmm. And you grow up with that thought. It creates a lot of determination within yourself. Now you were born in nineteen forty eight, I think. Yeah, I was born right? in nineteen forty eight. In the name of the greatest people that have ever trod this earth, I draw the line in the dust and toss the gauntlet before the feet of tyranny, and I say segregation now, segregation tomorrow, and segregation forever. Most of the people who are listening to this won't understand what North Carolina was like at that moment. So, I mean, are you talking about did you have to sit in a different place in movie theaters? I mean, were water fountains different? What was it? What, did you experience that? That was one of the more demeaning things that I had to encounter. But but I use it as a motivator. Uh, it's hard to go downtown to the store and you had to use the colored bathroom. You had to use the colored water fountain. Uh, there were restaurants you just absolutely couldn't go in. Uh, one of the things that my parents did for Sunday that night many times with our family is we would <laughs> we would get in the back in his car, the four boys would be in the back seat, my sister would be in between my mother and father in the front seat, and we would go to this restaurant that that black folks were not allowed to come into. And he'd go to the window, ring the bell, order two hot dogs apiece for all of us, milkshake apiece. He would order it, then come back and sit in the car until they flagged him back in. And we sat in the car, eat those hot dogs, and drink those milkshakes. That was a, a evening that we looked forward to. But, it, it, but I always, in my mind, had mixed feelings about that. You know, it was a little demeaning um, in, in, in many cases, in many ways. And, and I was always thinking, wow, and you accepted it uh, even though you didn't like it. Uh, but it always uh, served as a motivator for me. I, I wanted to always have a better life. Than that. And though my father would always tell me, you have to worry about that which you can control. So I remember in the fourth grade, you know, I was trying to mess around with a little football and basketball. My father was 6'3", about 280. He's a big guy. He would say, Leonard, don't ever let anybody outwork you. Hmm. Your supervisor, your coach, your boss might make a mistake. If you let it be close, it's on you. And the second thing he told me was that don't ever come to him complaining Hmm. because he didn't want to hear it. You control your own destiny. He didn't want to hear saying that the coach was playing favoritism. Or he liked somebody else more than he liked you. He said he didn't want to hear it. You had to figure it out yourself. Those two things kind of probably is what I anchored my life on. Believing that I couldn't let anybody outwork me. Mm-hmm. 
and not having anybody to make excuses to. That, 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 that was just all I knew. Those were staples in my mind than anything I went into. It, it wasn't only, it didn't only relate to athletics. It's just whatever I did. You know, that was a way of life. And I, I remember coming home one day, I was kind of a talkative youngster, mm -hmm. and I was just running my mouth with some of the other kids, and my mother brought me into the house. She said, Lena, you should always think before you speak. Because <laughs> <laughs> sometimes when you're just talking, you're just talking. Good advice today. Yeah. <laughs> and then she said, it's not important that everybody know what you're thinking. So it kind of always gave me a, a, a template for how to conduct myself. Mm -hmm. You know, think before you speak. It's not important that everybody know what you're thinking. Sometimes we just get in conversations where we're just competing. Right. My dog's bigger than your dog. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. One up in each other. Yeah, yes. Right. Yeah. And, and I never had that, so I was always listening. So, so I had a good life. I had a, a good life growing up. And I think that, you know, God has a purpose for all of us. And uh, once I met with two ministers, and because I was feeling like I was getting away from, I was so much into coaching that it took me away from working in the church. And I was concerned about it. So I asked these two ministers, and they met with me for breakfast. And uh, they said, what you do as a ministry, when you work with young people. And they said, God has a purpose for all of us. And it's important for him, for you to come, you know, to, to fulfill that purpose. And I asked the question, <laughs> how am I supposed to know I'm fulfilling the right purpose? And they told me when a piece of understanding comes over you and you feel good about what you do. And so I feel good about everything I do, everything I've done. I've done it to the best of my ability. And so I've been, I'm at peace with how I do things. And I'm still fired up. Now, about my earlier um, life, it was somewhat challenging. We moved from one bad situation to one that was not quite as bad, you know. Uh -huh. yeah. And, uh, you know, with no hot and cold running water. It's a bathroom on the back porch, taking, taking your bath in tin tubs, you know, ranking them out and yeah. letting someone else use it. It, it, it. That was just a way of life. We'll be back right after this. Welcome back. Well, in high school, you were saying off air, you had more football scholarship offers, actually, than basketball. What sort of high school athlete were you? Well, I played football. <laughs> I was a quarterback. <clears throat> and the uh, only reason I played football was because my father wanted me to play. <laughs> and this was, and back up for a second, but what high school was this? And you, it was uh, segregated completely? Yes. An all-black high all school? All-black school. Okay. Holland High School okay. in, in Gaston. And uh, we played West Charlotte. Uh, second. I think it was Second Ward. Yeah. And uh, schools like that. Kings Mountain, you know, local schools. We didn't really know that much about segregation at the time. We did just, you play all black schools or did you play yes, some integrated no, no, schools? No, no, not doing, okay. not doing the early 60s. Okay. You know, we played people in our league. Mm -hmm. And it was extremely competitive and lots of fun. Mm -hmm. And, um, uh, you I played were the quarterback. Yeah, I, I played quarterback. I played football uh, because um, my father wanted me to play, you know. And <clears throat> my father would never come in the games. Really? He, would, he would park his car on the hill on the fence and scream and holler at me. <laughs> 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 now, I wasn't nearly as good as he thought I was, yeah. you know. He's a typical father. Yeah. But uh, that was fun. It kept me out of trouble, kept me active, and I enjoyed that. Well, where did basketball come into it? Well, obviously, I was a, in our neighborhood, basketball was just a way of life. I mean, we played in morning, noon, and night, you know. And uh, it, was, it occupied us. And you out there dribbling the ball in the hot sun. We had an outdoor court. Uh, we, and then when we finally got Urban Center, uh, the recreation center, it was like linoleum laying on cement. So <laughs> that's why I've had two hip surgeries. <laughs> yeah, that might not be great. <laughs> beat, for up, your... <laughs> beat, beat up, my, I, I beat up my joints. But, <laughs> but, but having been close enough to the recreation facilities, it occupied all my time. Mm 
And so I didn't have time sometimes. I didn't have much time to figure out how to get in into trouble because I was over there always at, at the swimming pool, basketball courts. Was it walking distance? Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It was within, Close. Yeah. Within eight minutes probably of where I grew mm. up. So this, that was a blessing within itself just to have uh, recreation, the things that I could do close to where I live. Well, so you finished high school and you mentioned that you thought about going into the Army? <laughs> <laughs> well, playing high school basketball, we had a really good basketball team. And, you know, I scored quite a few points. And, and I, I would like to say, I, I was, for the group that I played with, I was a pretty good basketball player. And, but I had to plan to go to the Army, uh, even though I didn't realize what Vietnam, what was going on in Vietnam, I probably would not have <laughs> tried to join. And yeah. I really understood what was That was, was going right on. in the heat of Vietnam. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yes. Mm-hmm. And uh, as I was planning on going to join, there was a coach named, <clears throat> named Book Brooks that uh, had just taken over the job at Gaston Community College. And he really wanted to take the program to another level. So he's riding around the community trying to find uh, whatever basketball players he thought could play. There was a youngster, Hunter Huss, named Jim Turpin. And he had a plethora of other older guys who just were, who played basketball who was go- enrolled in school there. And so and he was a more of a liberal-minded guy. He's he, he meant a lot, awful lot to me. Um, and he was chasing me around town, and I would be in homes and tell him, you know, tell him I'm not here. Because I'm, I'm, I made my mind up, I'm going to the army. But he was so persistent <laughs> that every time I'd see him, I, I'd duck and go in the other room. Didn't know. You know, I didn't know. I mean, I was thinking I'm going to the army, so why are you wasting my time talking to him? But, and so I had some friends where I hung out you know, sometime during the day. And he finally caught me. And what he said to me probably changed my life. He made so much sense because I didn't have any money to pay for education. And I decided that I, that at least I go try. And that was the best decision I ever made in my life. And, but I kind of enrolled late. Funny story. Uh, so I enrolled late and my first class was a, a night class in, in math. So it, Gastonia was a county, was a textile industrial corporated area where a lot of folks worked with tool, and, they were tool and dye specialists and they had to work with a lot of numbers. Mm-hmm. And so I, I got to the class just a little late. <laughs> I went to class and they were arguing about this formula. <laughs> well, obviously I had never seen the X's and the Y's and the Z's and the, with the little twos on the side of it. And, and, and the, the sideways alligators. Ah, uh, sideways alligators. <laughs> okay, right. Well, I ain't never seen this. I didn't know yeah. what that was. And so they were arguing about this equation. And uh, she turned and she asked me, she said, Mr. Hamilton, what do you think? <laughs> so, so I'm in this class saying, what can I say? Yeah. That won't make me look as unaware of what they talk about as I am. And I was just pausing for a little bit, <laughs> trying to gather my thoughts. And somebody in the back, he was just furious. He said, I work in this, I work with this every day. And he took the, he walked up to the board, he took the car, he said, We do it this way and we do it this way. And I said, Whew. <laughs> <laughs> and the next day I went to my coach and said, Coach. I mean, that math class, bro. I'm still counting on my fingers and my toes. <laughs> you put you in like calculus or yeah, something. Right. Right. So that's how my that's how my that was, that was not an auspicious start, but it got better, I'm sure. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. So that was in about 1966. Six. Okay. And so you were you became good enough at Gaston College and went to UT Martin. Uh, right. Well, yes. Yeah, well, that's we, where you finished. Well, we had a game. And I scored 54 points one time. Mm. And that kind of got a little national attention. 54 and, is a lot, yeah. And um, so as time would go on, we have we get into the next season, had a pretty good year, and <laughs> the coaches sent me a scholarship. But, but see, I didn't know I was supposed to sign it. <laughs> you still hadn't learned. <laughs> <laughs> it sent it back. You know? So 
but I was planning on going. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'd saved, I worked all summer, saved money. I, I had, I had even gotten some local scholarships from, from the, I think it was Citizens Bank in Gastonia. Mm-hmm. Uh, from the, the mayor had recommended me for it. I used to play pickup ball with the mayor in lunch at the YMCA. And that's a whole nother story. Huh. I didn't have enough money to join the YMCA. <laughs> <laughs> so, but they let me in. Uh, you know, nice. that's another, yeah. that's another uh, blessing. Yes. Uh-huh. And just to meet, play pickup game with the mayor. Mm. But, you know, that, right, that's big. You know, yeah. from, from the hood where I came from. Yeah, here yeah. you're playing with basketball with the mayor. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh-huh. he, he, uh, it was Earl Groves. Earl Grubbs, that okay. was his name. Mm-hmm. And I did not know I was going to be the first black basketball player to ever play at Eugene Martin. Nobody, nobody told me that. <laughs> <laughs> didn't tell you you were going to no. be a trailblazer. But when no. I called the coach and said, Coach, I just want you to know I'm coming, he, he said, you didn't send the scholarship back. He said, I, I'm out of scholarship. I said, well, I'm coming anyway. So now I worked hard, saved money, Got loans and grants. And, really? And I figured if I get there, yeah. they'll figure out some way. Yeah. You know, so uh, I went you to You bet school. on yourself. Yes, I yeah. did. Mm-hmm. And I had that kind of confidence. But, but it was, I thought it was important for me, though, to get out of that environment because I didn't have very much to look up to, very nothing other than my mother and father. And I, I didn't see people who had been successful and got their education in my community. And so I, I, I had the presence of mind to understand that I, I need to move as far away from Gastonia as I could mm-hmm. and, and find a way how to make it happen, uh, like my father had taught me. So I was there, and after about two weeks, me playing pickup ball with the team, he, they, they manipulated something and figured out how to pay for my education. Mm-hmm. And I had a wonderful experience. The first year I transferred there, you know, I had to sit out that year because I didn't transfer enough credits. Mm-hmm. Nobody ever talked to me about credits, you know. Mm-hmm. I, was just, uh, I was just going to school. Yeah. I didn't have anybody telling me. <laughs> Did you pass that math class? <laughs> <laughs> Figure out what those sideways no, alligators were. <laughs> no, I, 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 th- I think maybe I might have dropped that math <laughs> course. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah, I think I would have too. When yeah. I figured out what those in, inverted alligators were, yeah, right? <laughs> what that two was sitting on top of the X, <laughs> right? Yeah, but I, but I had a wonderful career out there, and I have a lot. To thanks for Coach Coach Brooks. Coach Brooks was trying to sophisticate me, trying to make me a little bit more aware uh, of the world because I had been so sheltered. And unexposed. Uh huh. Were you just around African American people yes, like yes, yes. your entire life yes, up until yes. Yes. But, what Gaston College, I guess? Yes, or, yes, yeah. absolutely. But but the significant thing was my father never taught me to dislike people. Mm-hmm. He always taught me to respect people. So I wasn't a, an angry black kid. You know, I I, I didn't have any reason to because no one in my family during those times of riots and marches. And my father gave me a different perspective. You control your own destiny. I I, I didn't, and I had not experienced Mm -hmm. some of the racism that other folks had experienced because I I, I never worried about it. I I felt that I had to, I had to figure it out myself. And that was my whole purpose. But I bet you did experience it once you were playing at Gaston College, right? No question. you know, we would go on the road playing, and we couldn't stay in certain hotel because I was on the team. Were you the only black player at Gaston College? Or? My, my first year there, oh, I, wow. I was, and okay. uh, I was the first. I think another youngster came with me, uh, but I was the, the player, the main player. Uh, we played at a military school once, and you know, they was hitting me with ice and peanuts, and, you know, bubble bands, and, you know, calling all kinds of. But, but, you know, I ignored it, no. never responded. Mm. And it got so bad that my coach locked me in the locker room at halftime and wouldn't let me come out because he feared for not, what something might, might happen. Or you mean you I, didn't play the second half? I didn't play the second half. And, and the, it was a military school, and for whatever reason, 
something happened during the game, and they emptied the stands on my team. And uh, Coach Brooks had to go to the hospital that got his back hurt. And so they was out there fighting mostly because of me, and I'm in the locker room protected and can't get out. Whoa. And uh, that was that was. You terrible. mean the, the fans came yes. out of the stands yes. and started swinging? Yes. Yes, yes. And your own coach got hurt? Yes. Oh, my goodness. And wow. I'm, in the, I'm in the locker room. Yeah, you can't do anything because you're locked in from well, the – Which was probably was – Well – Look back at it, it probably was In best. a way, might have been a – Yeah, a blessing, but – But I, I know I, you felt terrible oh, about it. Yeah. Felt, felt horrible. Yeah. Felt horrible. But that, that was the sound of the times. But mm-hmm. Coach Brooks always stood by me. I mean, whatever the issue was, he was done on, on the spot. He would invite me to pasta night at the Howard Johnson. <laughs> pasta night. You see? In, in Gastonia? Yes. Yeah, okay. So yeah. it's funny. I tell this story. And he was trying to teach me how to use a, a spoon and a fork to roll up my spaghetti. Yeah. And, and in my mind, what is this guy talking about? <laughs> I don't need to. <laughs> what sense does it make? <laughs> For me to take my fork <laughs> and right. roll up the spaghetti <laughs> right. on a spoon. What what tree did he jump out of? Yeah, That's what yeah, I'm saying. Right, right. You know? yeah. and, I, and, and it was irritating to me because number one, I didn't know how to do it. Number yeah. two, it didn't make sense. Right. And, yeah. And so mm. it took me a long while to understand. <laughs> hey, look, I just <laughs> Yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah. That's it, much more efficient. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but when I look back at it, here this guy was, realized I was unsophisticated, unexposed, unaware. And he was trying to bring me out of this sheltered existence that I grew up in, trying to help me. And, and when I think about that, yeah. it, it kind of makes me emotional for a guy to care that much about someone, to try to help them without embarrassing me, let me know that I didn't know what was going on in the real world. Yeah, pasta <laughs> night at the Howard Johnson. <laughs> Isn't that something? We'll be back right after this. Welcome back. So to move ahead a little bit, but so you became a coach at Austin P uh, first, right after college. And well, or is there something in between? <laughs> well, actually, I was trying to, trying to figure out how not to have to go to, to Vietnam again. Oh, okay. So my, my coach had recommended the National Guard. One of my professors had taught me to join in the Marines. And I, I'm, I'm evaluating all these situations, and there was a graduate assistant opening at Austin P, which was – probably an hour and 15 minutes from UT Martin. So my coach called the head coach and sent him a letter of recommendation. And I went up for the interview and they hired me on the spot. But the interesting thing about going to Austin P is that, you know, I'm still, I'm 23 years old, married, had adopted my brother and had a, and had a son, you know? And um, you'd adopted your brother, yeah. Adopted my brother, William. What, what'd you do that for? Well, because he was raised in the same environment I was in, from, and I knew that I had to find a way not only to set the table for him, and in order for him to be successful, I had to get him his education. Mm-hmm. So I adopted him and brought him to live with me wow. in, in our two bedroom apartment. <laughs> and y'all were married and had a had, had your a own baby, yeah, okay, yeah. yeah. And, wow. so, and, yeah. and, and, and so I was very fortunate to work for one of the top coaches and one of the best human beings that I could ever work for, a guy named Lake Kelly. Mm. It was his first head job. Mm. And he had only been the head coach there for a year. And by, by coincidence, he was head coach at Lexington Lafayette in, in Lexington. But the significant thing about that is that I'm 23 years old. It's right out of college. I'm actually got guys on the team that are older than me, okay? Yeah. And in, in January, the full-time assistant coach became ill. He had to resign. So now I'm all the head coach had at 23. Wow. So the head coach is on his end of the court teaching his drills. 
and I'm on the other end teaching my degree at 23. So I had to figure out how to be motivating, inspiring. I had to learn how to communicate, uh, be positive, and be accurate so the guys could learn to respect me. So in April, I asked him, would he let me go on the road with crew? I had never been in New York in my life, but I had started reading all these magazines and all these reports of where the players were. Yeah, they're play New York City playground legends to be had, right? So, and so you I, got one. I, uh, so tell us that story. I, I asked him, yeah. I asked him, will you let me? He said, where do you want to go? I said, New York. But I was so green. I didn't know you had to have a credit card to rent a car. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> how do you think you rented it? <laughs> I thought you'd walk up to the Just counter. Just give him some cash. <laughs> <laughs> you laughing, but that's exactly what I thought. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, so he gave me some money and said, okay, go. He didn't tell me what to do, tell me how to do it. He just sent me out. And I walk up to the airport, I mean to the Avis rental car desk, and I said, I'd like to rent a car, please. I said, sure. <laughs> he said, your driver license and your credit card. <laughs> so I get this look, I said, I don't have a credit card, but I have cash. She said, we, we can't rent you a car without cash. I said, okay. <laughs> so now I'm running late. I jumped in a taxi, but I, I went to the, the gym and, you know, just got the feeling around a little bit and I figured out who seemed to have the, the uh, handle on where the players were. So you didn't go there for any particular player. No. You just went there to go yes. find some. Yes. Like, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I didn't know what I was doing. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. I yeah. had that hedge of protection. Yes. Uh -huh. me. <laughs> yes. Right. My steps were ordered. It was useful ordered. here. My yes. steps were ordered. <laughs> right. Especially in New York. <laughs> yes. For sure. <laughs> anyway, yeah. so I met this gentleman that I figured out knew where all the kids were. And... Not New York legend. Not street ball legend. I am the international legend. Jane Fly Wynn. I got my name Fly from the way I dress. The ladies that travel with me, and then my game got fly, fly. I went, I went to, to this kid, Fly Williams, who I recruited at Austin P. And the interesting thing is, when I, he told me that if I recruited his friend, I would have a good chance of recruiting him. So I met with his friend, and I got lost in New York City on the subway. I had no idea where I was going. Man. It was rough. I was all over the place. Getting off on this and this oh, and that. Oh, it's hard. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. so I finally got him, got there, and he was leaving. They waited on me about an hour. I got to know him, invited him down, and then I went to Fly's house that night. We got there at 7 o'clock, and he was supposed to be home at 7, but he didn't come. 8 o'clock, he still hadn't got there. 9 o'clock, he still hadn't got there. So the gentleman that I was with said, well, look, I got to go. Now, where am I going? You know, yeah. I am not going outside this house at night. Right. Right. <laughs> and I was in a pretty rough part of the city. Mm -hmm. So I said, well, I'll just stay here and wait. And mother was very nice. She from that, matter of fact, she was originally from North Carolina. Mm -hmm. So we talked and we talked and we just kept right on talking. So now it's one o'clock. Kid, he's not there. Yeah. I said, I'm not leaving. Okay. So she went up. She got up, went to the bathroom, and I turned the clock back to level. <laughs> turned the clock back. In I, the kitchen, I you mean? Yeah, the kitchen like, was okay. sitting on the table. So I yeah. put that bad boy back, you know what I mean? So, so we kept talking, and we kept back. talking. And now she had to go to the bathroom again, but the sun was about to come up. So I, I pulled the curtains down so she wouldn't see the sun. And I closed the blind. <laughs> she wouldn't see the sun coming up. And so about 7.30, he knocked on the door, Mom, I'm home. But from that moment, he and I just hit it off. I've been there all night long, 12 hours, waiting for him to come. You know? But what I'm saying to you, you know, who does that? I mean, I, I just wasn't going to leave. Yeah. You know, I had to outwork everybody. The... Um and the famous, of course, uh, for those uh, listeners who don't know, James Williams was nicknamed Fly. The school was Austin P, and that prompted one of college basketball's best chance ever, which was, the fly is open, let's go pee. <laughs> I still love that one, even oh, today. Yeah. We'll be back right after this.
Welcome back. You were at Kentucky from 1974 to 86, uh, was part of a national championship there in 1978. What was your Kentucky experience like? The, it was an experience getting to Kentucky. We had played Kentucky the first time Austin P had ever gone to the NCAA tournament. I think it was, might have been a double overtime game, 106-103 in Nashville, Tennessee. And obviously, being from Austin P, unknown school, playing Kentucky, a master contender, to that type of game, people tried to figure out, well, who helped put that together at a school that was picked to finish last in, in, in the conference? And so Joe knew of me. Um, and my, the reason I left Austin P, people don't know, but I, re, I, re, I resigned. You resigned. Uh, Why? Because we go to the NCAA tournament two years in a row. It won the conference two years in a row. We basically the team that that I was fortunate enough to be a part of and help recruit. And Coach Kelly has started to get mentioned for a lot of big time jobs around the country. And once again, I did not realize there wasn't a whole lot of head black black head coaches in the country. And I had a great relationship with the president, who, uh, Mr. Coach President Morgan, who had hired me. So I, I walked into his office and said, you know the Lake's getting considered for, for a lot of jobs. His name is being mentioned for SEC jobs of that caliber. I want to know, am I going to be the next head coach at Austin Pooh? Now, I wasn't, you know, I'm not a cocky person. You know, I'm not a person who thinks I, that I'm better. That's not my M.O., but I wanted to know. But I didn't realize I was only 26. And I didn't realize that it wasn't very many black head coaches, period, in the country. And so why, what gave me the confidence and the idea that I could be a head coach there? But I did, asked him. And uh, he told me nothing would make him happy for me to be the head coach. But he's retiring in two years. And he wasn't sure he was strong enough. Now, that was about as nice as he could, hmm. as he could say it. He wasn't strong enough. What did that mean? Well, I mean, you know, he was leaving out. And so you have to have, during that era, it, it wasn't fashionable. And, and, and to be very honest with you, what had I done? I mean, I, I recruited Fly, I recruited Danny, and some of the other kids that helped us. But, but that was not significant enough. I probably didn't earn, hadn't earned the right to get here. But the confidence that I had been blessed with, I thought I was ready. And, I, and I, I really felt that. But it hurt me so much. It, it's, it's, you know, it just kind of cut my guts out because I couldn't be the head coach because I was black. Did he? So you no, he understood didn't say that's, that. that's not what he said. That's not what he said. No, he would you, not. Uh, you he, knew that. Yeah, he would not have yeah. said that because he and I, he cared enough about me. But, but that's how I read it. Mm -hmm. and that was on a Wednesday. Mm -hmm. I resigned on Thursday. And I moved out of my house on Friday. I took a job in Charlotte, North Carolina for Dow, with Dow Chemical. <laughs> we could have had you in Charlotte, huh? So I, Dow Chemical. With Dow Chemical. <laughs> okay. And uh, I went to work that Monday. And, and, and Joe Hall called me by 12 o'clock at the hotel where we were staying. And I called him back. He said, I have an opening on my staff. Uh, would you like to be considered for it? I said, sure, coach. I said, when would you like to get together? He said, Wednesday. Well, I couldn't miss three days of work. I just started yeah. that Monday. Right. He said, I won't be back until about 2 o'clock tomorrow. And so Wednesday would be good. So I said, coach, can I call you back? I called and made my own plane reservation. Paid for my own ticket. Really? So I called him back and I said, coach, I'll be there tonight. And I'll wait on you till you get back to bar at two. <laughs> you know? He said, you don't mess around, huh? <laughs> but, but, but that's what how happened I, to Dow Chemical. You just, uh, well, what'd you, what you tell them? <laughs> okay, it's interesting. So I go on the interview that was on that Tuesday night. And at the end, I told Coach, uh, you know, if he didn't have anything else to talk to him about, I, could, he, could he arrange for me to fly back to uh, 
to Charlotte. So I went to work that, that Wednesday. And I'm getting ready to be a, the number one chemical salesman in the country. Hmm. So that we supposed to move out that weekend. I decided I'd wait till Monday after I got off of work. And I went to work at Monday, and, and during that, that period, at, from 12 to 1, most of the executive people all went to lunch from 12 to 1. So I walked back across the street at 12 in the hotel. <laughs> My wife said, Joe Hall called you. So it, I called him back. He offered me the job I accepted. So I said, well, let me go back to, to Dow Chemical and thank them, but I need to move on. Because I was ready to, I was through with coaching. Mm-hmm. You know, I was just that emotional. Mm-hmm. And um, so it wasn't anybody there for me to resign to. So I, I wrote, I, I got a piece of paper off somebody's <laughs> desk, and I said, to whom it may concern. <laughs> I resigned my position effectively, immediately. <laughs> Thank you very much for the opportunity, <laughs> Little Hamilton. <laughs> Thank and, you for my full week of work when I'm going to Kentucky. So you, keep, you keep the money. <laughs> but no, but and then at Lexington, uh, your experience there, I mean, that's, that's where you really made a name for yourself, right? So I go from not having a job to the number one winners program in the history of college basketball. Now, I, once again, I say, that's not me. That's God's grace on my life. That's my, that hedge of protection around me and my steps have always been ordered. How does that happen? From Gastonian to the community college, not the army, to UT Martin, a school that didn't have black basketball players, to Austin P, to Kentucky. It, it's like the stars were lining up for me. So I had to do everything I could to make sure I earned the right to be there. And so I just pinned my ears back and, and, and worked my butt off. But at the same time, I adopted another brother, Barry, <laughs> you know, to uh, help him get through. Really? You know. Then I adopted my sister, Pam. <laughs> How many children have, have you raised over the years? Well, well, first it was Willie. I mean, I, I'm 23 and he's 17. Wow. So it wasn't yeah. like, yeah. It, it, it was just for... Medical purposes, if something was to happen, and you know th- that kind of stuff. With Barry, you know, he was fourteen when I when I when I when I got him, and then uh, my sister Pam, she was I think I adopted her when she was twelve, thirteen, something like that. And so, but but how else was I going to fulfill my father's request? Mm-hmm. You you guys need to get your education. Mm-hmm. So I go to school, I get my degree, I adopt Willie. He goes to college. He meets his wife. She's in college. He has two kids and they go to college. See, it changed the whole culture. To back up for a second to church, I think anyone listening to this uh, can understand how good of a voice you have. I've always enjoyed listening to you in press conferences. It sounds like a singing voice. Are you a singer? Well, I, I don't. Let, let's just say this. Um, in the church, they say they want you to make a joyful noise. <laughs> now, now, you know, God don't want you to make an awful noise. He wants to be joyful. But right. well, let's say I could make a joyful noise, okay? <laughs> Sometimes it might hurt your ears, but, it, but I think it was joyful. But on a serious note, that was just part of, of uh Were you in we, the choir and yeah, stuff? Yeah, oh gosh. Yeah. Yeah. That was so much fun. Mm. I mean, you know, you start out in a little choir, you yeah. know what I mean? And it's not whether or not you can sing good, it's whether or not you got enough courage to stand up there uh, right. and remember the words. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody right. cared about yeah. what you sound like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's kind of where we got started. But we had such a good choir, such a good choir director. I mean, it was just part of our life. You know, we would sing for service at 11. And then we go do two programs in the afternoon, come back and do the evening church service, and go do another program at night. That's every Sunday. What would be your favorite two or three hymns well, the, of all time? Well, the thing of it is, I like so many. And, and, and when you get to be my age, sometimes you can't remember all the words. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, I guess, though, if somebody asked me to sing, to sing something, I would say, I yeah. really love the Lord. Hmm. Oh, I really love the Lord. That's about all I know. <laughs> wow, that's fantastic. Yes, <laughs> but 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 we would have choir practice on Tuesday. It'd be over about nine, and then we sit on the church steps and sing the level. 
And all the neighbors would sit out on their porch. And listen. And listen. Uh, but that, that was a way of life with us. I mean, it, was, it occupied our time so much. Listen to music so we could go take it back to the choir director so we could learn the song. And, and in our culture, it was competition about with choirs. You know, and we wanted to have the best choir in town. Uh-huh. You know what I mean? We, and we like to think that we did. Hmm. And that was a, a, a way of life. Uh, we lived it, we walked it, enjoyed it, and we believed in it. And, and you still surf, uh, as you say. Tell me about your sort of nighttime uh, routine that you were well, mentioning. Well, you know, I know I have a gospel music label. Yes, tell me about that. And I have, yeah. I have artists that mm-hmm. record on my label. Which is called what? Your Five label. Oceans. Five Oceans. I wanted to come up with a name. So I think the five oceans touches the entire world. But in the ocean, you have so many different species. Mm-hmm. And I wanted to be have music that touched a lot of different people. And um, I, I wanted to have that s- serenity that you feel when you're sitting there by the ocean. This gives you kind of a, a feeling that comes on, a calm yes. effect. Mm-hmm. And um, uh, I, I've only done a couple albums, but, but that's just part of who we are, who I've always been. And I, I don't ever get away from it. I, I don't know a night doesn't go by where I'm not listening to some gospel. We'll be back right after this. Welcome back. Uh, you did, you've, you've been in college coaching nearly all of these five decades we're talking about, except for one year uh, in 2000, oh, 2001 where you worked for Michael Jordan and were, and were the coach of the Washington Wizards. How was that? Well, it was, a, it was challenging because they were in a rebuilding posture. It had been obvious, it's obvious that it needed some fixing up. And I, I embraced the opportunity and uh, coached the best I could with the kids that we had, the players that we had. And but I I realized that I'm better suited for college. Why? Well, because <clears throat> I like taking youngsters, teenagers, and helping them develop into young adults. That's to me is something that I think people from my community needed. Mm-hmm. I needed it. Not to say anything negative about the NBA. It was a great experience for me. Um, Michael decided he wanted to come back and play. Four is fouled by Whitten. Jordan. 51 for Michael. I think that's what they were going for, and I think he'll probably come out of the game now. And 100 for Washington. He has more than half their points. But not your year. He well, didn't play for you. No, but, but, yeah. but he, he hired Doug, Doug Collins, Collins, right? who he right. had played for in Chicago. Previously. Now, if, I'm, yeah. if I'm a great player like him, I kind of like to have it be in a system that I'm familiar with, with a coach who I'm familiar with. Mm-hmm. Who and so from, my, from that standpoint, I was Did fine. Michael hire you too? Yes. Or he had hired you, but yes. then he also then he fired you basically, I well, guess. Or well, did you resign? No, no. It, it made sense to me if he was going to play. Mm. Doug Collins was the guy he needed to have with him. Okay. I mean, I mean, yeah. that's what I would have done. In mm-hmm. the it was opportunity, a security blanket, sort abs- of. Well, yeah. whatever, he, whatever it was. But yeah. for me personally, you know, every job that was coming open was trying to get to my attorney to see what I'd be interested in. Yeah. So I knew I was always going to be able to get a college job. Yeah. And that's the first vacation year I've ever had in the, all the years I've been coaching. You deserved had, it. What did you do? You were one year off. I in tried 50. to yeah. do nothing. I tried. <laughs> I tried hard. But now I'm at the TV. I'm cussing the referees. <laughs> I'm fussing at the players. Uh-huh. I'm slamming something on the floor. And my wife went down. She said, you need to get a job. <laughs> she said, this is not working. <laughs> 
And right after that, you got the Florida State job and have been there ever since. And now you're the dean of ACC coaches. Really? Um, really? I mean, so many of the people you're of your uh, age group, at least, Roy, Coach K, Bayheim, all have left. And yet you look as young as ever. You don't look like you're near leave, leaving. What, what do you do when people ask you the retirement question now? Well, it, it's starting to be a little more of a challenge without the, the questions because some coaches like to use that against you in recruiting. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> and with all the challenges that exist in, in college sports now, with the portal and, and uh, <clears throat> the NIL. And when you look at where we are now, kind of re regrouping and rebuilding to where we have been on a consistent basis for long periods, if you look at me on TV, you might say, man. <laughs> <laughs> if I looked at me on TV, I might want to say, hey, he, 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 he looked like maybe he can really do something. <laughs> but, but in reality, I've, never, I've always been a fighter. You know, I've never been a person who walked with me in the challenges. And, and I feel like it's important that I reestablish our program as to where we have been. And um, uh, I, I feel I, I have as much energy as I always have had. Um, it is becoming more challenging, the, the, the landscape of college basketball you see coaches saying, I, I don't want to deal with this. This is at a whole other level that I didn't. I yeah, didn't. you didn't sign up for <clears throat> that. That's what no, I mean, some say. Some of the yeah. most significant football and basketball coaches in the country, you know, um, are saying goodbye. Yeah, Nick Saban too. I mean, a yeah. lot of these people are also in their 70s. Right, yeah. yeah. But, but for me, I'm kind of a little, a little bit too much of a fighter, you know, and uh, – I don't feel like I've completed my job, and I feel like I still got more work to do. And then when you have a dip, sometimes you got to figure out how to climb back out of it. A lot, a lot of people, it affects the other way. But right now, today, I'm, I'm as focused as I ever have been. And um, when that time comes, you know, like I said, that, that piece of understanding is still with me every day. When, when that piece stops to exist, and I start being challenged by all the, the differences and the challenges that now possess. You know, I'll do it the right, at the right time in the right way. I don't feel that now. The Florida State Seminoles will be the Atlantic Coast Conference AQ and will represent this great conference in every conceivable positive way. Leonard, come on up here. In 2020, you had a team that won the regular season ACC championship. Maybe your best team ever. Uh, maybe would have won a national championship. Do you think that team would have gone further than any other team you've had? Well, in terms of the way we want to play, I had all the right pieces. And our system, the way we play, is a little different than what everybody else plays, you know, offensively and defensively. I thought we had as good a chance as anyone because we had plenty of depth, we were big, sized, and, and because we play a little different, mm -hmm. because we play so many people, and we try to maintain the, the, the energy level for the full 40 minutes, and because we switch one through five, because we, we overplay and deny and front the post and do things that most people feel uncomfortable with. And we try to push the ball and play unselfish and win by committee as opposed to having three or four lead people that you know, you're leading scores every night. I like it when we have nine different guys a year lead our team in scoring. Mm. It's more challenging to prepare for. That team had all those ingredients. And I was so excited and looking forward we like to say we were like Noah's Ark. We had two of everything. <laughs> <laughs> right. Perfect. Yes, of course, that, I, I didn't refer to it at the beginning, but that was because of COVID uh, that you also didn't play the ACC tournament and were, in fact, just handed the trophy right before a game, right? That must have been weird, a weird way to win one. To be very honest with you, and I, I'm a little bit embarrassed as to how that went down because mm. I didn't get the gist of what we were doing. Mm. And... 
we go out on the floor and and they had probably said that to me, but now I got this glazed look in my eye thinking, if we're not going to play this, does that mean we're not going to get a chance to play? So, so you, you're, yeah. you were talking to me, but I wasn't really listening. Yeah, yeah. So now I'm out here in the group and they're handing us the trophy. And I'm trying to figure out, do they want us to carry it back for somebody? You know, <laughs> was he handing it <laughs> right. for us to go place it on something? <laughs> but I didn't realize that since we had won the, the league, Mm-hmm. That that somebody and so that's kind of a backhand way of winning it. But you know what? I accept it. We yeah. accept it. <laughs> well, you won it. <laughs> Was that though? Um, when we when you think about uh, regrets in a fifty year coaching career, not getting to have a chance to win March Madness was would that be your biggest one, or was would there be something else? This is what I, the way I looked at. It. You got a pandemic. How selfish would it have been of me to want to put our players, the opponents, the fans, the reporters in jeopardy? Some people would have come out of there sick and with COVID. That was the only decision to make. So I was at peace. And to be honest with you, I've heard people say disappointed. But I can't say I was disappointed because I thought that was right. I thought that was the right decision made. And it was just an opportunity that I didn't have. But we had, I was thankful, you know, for the team that we did have. It's so unfortunate for my players not to have that unique opportunity because going, participating in the NCAA tournament just doesn't get any better. I've been to three Final Fours, you know, obviously won it. And, and I know how were they all with Kentucky? Yes, the three. Mm-hmm. And, and how how it, such an everlasting impression. I have a picture of my son uh, being in St. Louis with us when we won the title, and he has he's so happy he had a tear, yeah. you yeah. know, coming down his eye, yeah. down his face. It just doesn't get any better. No. As a head coach, uh, what would you consider your greatest joy? When I've seen my players walk across that stage and the president hugs them and give them a basketball along with their diploma, it just doesn't get any better. One of the things I'm most proud of that we've only had two players not graduate. In the twenty some years I've been at Florida State. Wow. That that, that stayed, stayed there four years. for four years. Mm-hmm. Two players. We so. had three in Miami, so in thirty some years I've only had five kids. Mm. You know, not get their degrees. What was it like coaching against uh Coach K and Roy and um Bayheim and some of your other contemporaries? Were you friends or was it difficult to be friends given that you were competing for the same trophies, the same players, the same everything? I admire those guys with what they were able to accomplish. But, but I, I, I never really had the luxury to be envious and jealous because I always had opportunities to work in programs that need a little fixing up. Yeah. I, I never had the luxury of going to a program that was already well healed with a plethora of success. One night I was a, when I was assistant at Kentucky, and quite naturally, by being there for 12 years, you know, year eight, nine, and 10, you start looking around saying, you know, when, what kind of opportunity yeah. should I be looking for? And I remember like it was yesterday, in the middle of the night, Lord reached down from heaven and slapped me on both sides of my face. Bam, bam. <laughs> Those problems that you're dreaming about, they don't need you. I mean, I'm sitting there dreaming about this program here that's located with all the players, this program over here with the tradition and the support. And it was like I came to the realization that those kind of programs didn't need what I brought to the table. And if I was ever going to have an opportunity to to prove that I belong and that I can handle it, I need to go to programs that need to be fixed, worked on a little bit, to, to prove what I'm capable of doing. Mm. So I couldn't think of a better program, uh, Oklahoma State, 
had been a solid program under Hank Alba, but they hadn't been to a postseason tournament in 27 years. That's my job. And then we had got it up that in year five, we had a really, really good team coming back. And my mentors, John Thompson, Don Thompson and George Ravlin, met me in Denver at the Final Four and told me I had to talk to the, head, the athletic director in Miami. Well, I, you know, uh, they were my guys. And I trusted their vision. And, um, that the athletic director had tried to call me back in September and October, but I, I felt some kind of way that there would be no way I could be encouraging my team to want to go win mm -hmm. at Oklahoma State and then me to get out that I'm talking to somebody else. So I, I just didn't engage. I didn't accept any call. Mm -hmm. You know, he called this person. And I just, I didn't, I wasn't disrespectful, but I didn't want to right. engage. Mm -hmm. And so now we had gone to the Final Four and he was still persistent. And, um, he, um, when John and George told me I need to go talk to the AD, I did. And he convinced me uh, that I need to come for a visit. Well, this is what I, this was my rationale. I'm in, I'm in Stillwater, Oklahoma. My family enjoyed it and had, but it wasn't like they was getting the exposure that would enhance who they were. My hours were going to be the same in Stillwater as it was in Miami. And so I, I got the feeling that they would have more opportunities and more exposure to other things mm -hmm. that would enhance their life and would be selfish of me not to look at Miami because it would give them more of a quality of life. And so as I went there, um, obviously, you know, it was a program that was didn't have basketball for 13 years. They, they came back as an independent, and didn't have no conference affiliation, and they needed a little fixing up, and that kind of that energized shit, that, me. You like that? Yeah. I, li I like the fixer upper. Yeah, you're yeah. like one of those HGTV shows. <laughs> <laughs> Leonard Hamilton's fixer uppers. <laughs> but 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 I found um, that was um, what inspired me, mm -hmm. and. Um, I enjoyed it. Last thing I'll ask you is just um, you've taught you've 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 taught to helped. You've done a lot of things for a lot of young people, hundreds of them, maybe thousands over fifty plus years. What so what what do you think is the most important piece of advice to give to young people today? But I try to instill in them, regardless of what you're doing, basketball, being a father, a neighbor, a citizen. There's a standard that in order to be successful that everyone has to meet. And the conversation, that's probably been the most enjoyable thing because you're taking teenagers mm -hmm. and you're urging them into young adulthood. And, and the impact you make on them in so many ways, how they think, what judgments they, they make, how they relate, when you think about it, they're going to be fathers, husbands, neighbors, citizens, leaders, and they most of the time they emulate who they play for. And so I have to be a person who communicates with them with respect <coughs> in a caring, loving way, but holding everybody accountable. And, and, and I like to think that that environment rubs off on them and helps them have a better quality of life as well. And it's so satisfying to me when I still communicate with people who I coach at Austin Peay. Mm -hmm. I, still, I still get really? phone calls. And <clears throat> they want you to be, be at their wedding. They want you to meet their fiance. Yeah. Uh, as coaches, we are giving recognition for how many games we win, how many NCAA tournaments we win, as, you know, how many Hall of Fames I'm in. I don't even, I can't even count, you know, 
But in reality, the most important thing we do is take young men and help them carve out a pattern so they can be successful in life. And when you look back, if you only have newspaper clippings and awards and Hall of Fames Trophies, and Coach of the yeah. Year and trophy, and believe me, I got plenty of them. And that's all you have in the kids who have come under your tutelage and they're not being successful, then what have you done? So it's gratifying to me, the most important thing is try in so many different ways to help them grow to reach their potential. See, God has blessed us all with a certain level of potential. And I tell my players, you honor God for the talent and the potential he's given you by doing the very best you can with what he's given you. And hopefully that will be enough for them to have a high quality of life. Because most of the kids that we have, they're first generation college students most of the time. And so it's so important that you put them on the right path. So when I look back and see in 30 years, we've only had five kids not graduate, that means we've done our job and helped them trying to prepare. That's the most gratifying thing that I can be happy about. Now that's well put. And that is Leonard Hamilton. I'm Scott Fowler. This is Sports Legends of the Carolinas. And thank you so much for joining us today, Coach. Well, thank you very much. Thanks so much for listening to Sports Legends of the Carolinas, a production of the Charlotte Observer. This show is produced by Lou May Ali Sally, Jeff Siner, and Cotta Stevens. The sports editor of the Charlotte Observer is Lydia Craver. The executive editor is Raina Cash. If you know a sports fan, we've got a great gift idea for you. We've compiled the first two seasons of the Sports Legends interviews into a coffee table book, which includes more than 100 rare photos. Among the 33 legends in the book are Steph Curry, Roy Williams, Mike Krzyzewski, Dale Earnhardt Jr., Steve Spurrier, Jake DeLome, and Don Staley. The first printing sold out quickly, but the book is back in stock now, and you can order a copy at sportslegendsbook.com. For lots more sports content, please visit charlotteobserver.com and consider a digital subscription. You can connect with me, Scott Fowler, by email at sfowler at charlotteobserver.com. Please subscribe, rate, and review the Sports Legends of the Carolinas podcast. Thanks for spending some time with us, and we'll see you next time.